Beyonce Knowles is one of the most famous women on the planet. She has the voice, the moves, the charms, and the wealth of a world-class diva. Writing, producing, and performing some of the most popular songs of the last decade, Beyonce has sold over 100 million records worldwide, making her one of the best-selling artists of all time. Beyonce first found fame in the 90s as the lead singer of R&B supergroup Destiny's Child, but it wasn't long before she stole the show and went on to have a stellar solo career. Her catchy, show-stopping anthems have captured the hearts, hands, and feet of millions of fans around the globe. Today, as well as being an award-winning singer and record producer, she's also an actress, a model, a clothes designer, and a businesswoman. She had this drive that wasn't going to be stopped. Is there anything this girl can't do? A strong, sexy, and sassy role model for young women everywhere, Beyonce is worth an estimated $300 million and counting. But where did it all begin? And what drove her to reach for such extraordinary heights of success? This is the story of how a young, God-fearing girl from Texas came to be one of the biggest superstars in the world. It's a tale of family, friendships, hard work and hard times that charts the peaks and troughs of success and failure in Beyonce's life. From heartaches to big breaks, close ties to separate lives, to the ultimate search for the one true love. This is the story of Beyonce, Beyond the Glam. Beyonce Giselle Knowles was born in Houston, Texas on 4th September 1981. Her father, Matthew Knowles, was a top salesman at Xerox and her mother owned hair salons. Beyonce was named after her mother Tina's maiden name and is the elder sister to Solange, born four years later. Her father's African American, her mother was Creole, and they both were entrepreneurs, so they were able to kind of embed in her this kind of strong work ethic. You could say it's that typical Hollywood kid born into parents who fiercely want their children to be pop stars or superstars. I do think family is really, really important. I grew up with both of my parents and with my sister and my cousin and Kelly and all the girls and it was always a lot of love in my house. Music was a big part of family life right from the start. When Beyonce was growing up, the Knowles often gathered around the piano as Matthew played. But it wasn't until school that Beyonce's singing talent was first noticed. During one of the classes, her dance teacher began humming a tune and the young Beyonce finished it, hitting all the high notes pitch perfectly. A mezzo-soprano, her voice spans an incredible three octaves. Beyonce's interest in performing really began when she won her first school talent show. It was the first of many. Words soon began to spread across Texas about the talented Miss Knowles. Beyonce kind of got the bug to sing. She said she'd seen Michael Jackson in the Jackson 5, and that just made her want to follow in those footsteps. So I think she was just eight or nine years old and started trying to sing wherever she could. She'd go to Walmart and, uh, you know, try to get an audience. I think from the moment Beyonce was born, she was destined to be a star. She was really interested in this. She loved it. She was passionate about it, but definitely it was an interest that was stoked very much by her parents, who probably could be described as being a little bit pushy. She would have ballet classes, dance classes. I mean, this girl was working really hard. Essentially, the entire childhood of Beyonce was focused on this goal. She got these parents who were on the peripheries of show business, and, and it was always like they were hell-bent on creating a child that would go on to be this massive pop star. And, you know, credit to them, uh, they, they seem to have done that, and she seems to be a functional human being, which those two things very rarely coexist. There was definitely um, a road that was mapped out for her in terms of the parents setting it up that she was going to go into showbiz, but she definitely had more flair than the average kid. When she was eight, Beyonce auditioned for an all-girl group and met Latavia Roberson. Beyonce's friend Kelly Rowland also made it into the band who were called Girls' Time. There was an open casting call for a girl group. That group went through uh, a number of changes. They, you know, uh, engaged in talent shows, talent contests, and, and started to get some notice. Girls' Time performed all over Houston and soon started generating a buzz. 
West Coast R&B producer Arne Frager heard about the girls and entered them for the biggest national talent show on television, Star Search. Welcome Beyonce, Lativia, Nina, Nikki, Kelly, and Ashley, the hip-hop rappin' girls' time. They got on Star Search, which was the same place that Britney Spears was on it, Christina Aguilera was on it. Pretty much anyone, if you, know, if you wanted to be, go on to greater fame, Star Search was the place. Expectations were high, but Girls' Time lost the competition, much to their devastation. Beyonce took it particularly badly. What was interesting is one of the producers apparently told Matthew Knowles, you know, it's actually a good thing, it's a blessing in disguise, because they go back and they kind of redouble their efforts. Following their first setback, three members of the group left. But in 1993, a fourth member, Latoya Luckett, was added. They decided to change their name. They basically kind of became Destiny's Child when her mother was reading the Bible and apparently she came to a picture that you know, she'd used, a photo of the girls as a bookmark, and it was in the book of Isaiah. And she um, came across the word Destiny and then Matthew Knowles added a uh, child. The girls quickly gelled and worked hard together, rehearsing in Beyonce's mom Tina's beauty salon, as well as in their backyards. They took to the road, opening for other R&B groups like SWV and Drew Hill. So after the disappointment, there were four years on the road, and they were hard years, but essentially this created Destiny's Child. But they weren't considered big enough to be a headline act. In 1995, Matthew Knowles quit his job as a highly successful salesman to become the girl's full-time manager. Matthew, from very, very early on, was convinced that Beyonce could be an international megastar. He gave everything to her career. He totally saw it. And you don't do that. You don't give up every single thing in terms of your own work for your kid unless you believe they have a superior talent. He put them through a boot camp style regime. So he molded these girls and stars. It was almost done with military precision. It was all his guidance and mum was there on the side designing the clothes and doing the hair. So you can see this nucleus of, of a family, how it's all staged and set up for showbiz. Later that same year, Destiny's Child signed to Elektra Records. It looked like everything was going to go so well in those early days because Matthew managed to secure this new band and his daughter, his pride and joy, Beyonce, a mega record deal with Elektra, which meant the whole family moved to Atlanta. She was signed up to a record company as Girls' Time, as a girl band, and her dad, very hardworking, determined for her, must have thought, this is it. And everything seemed to be going pretty well. And then they were dropped. The girls were dropped by the label before they could release a debut album. For Beyonce at that time, that was catastrophic. The hardest thing for an artist um, is getting signed in the first place. First of all, you go through that panic of, I really want to get a record deal. And then you think you're never going to get one. And then you get one. Then, if the record doesn't sell well, you get dropped. So you can imagine what Beyonce was going through when suddenly she thought, yes, finally, we've got the record deal. Finally, we've made the record. Actually, we don't want you anymore. They all returned home to start over again. This upheaval took its toll on the family. There'd already been so much pressure because of how much Matthew had been putting into this band. Actually, the marriage really suffered between Beyonce's mum and dad. Beyonce is very private, but what we have gleaned from interviews with her is that she had a real depressed time when her mum and dad split up, or rather, they were forced to live in separate departments because their money had been halved. During this difficult time in her personal and professional life, 14-year-old Beyonce focused on her goals. Many people, this would be the knock that made them come crashing down. I think it made Beyonce stronger. She even at that age did research to find out that the likes of Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake had knocks too. That empowered her. People on the outside looking in only see the glamorous parts of the industry and the career of a person, but they don't see all the other bits. And the reason why Beyonce is so driven is because she knows what rejection feels like. She had her dark moment, she picked herself up, she thought, I will be strong, and she went on to be one of the most recognized women in the world. In 1996, 
Matthew and Tina were reunited. This is pretty unusual. If a couple split up, usually they remain split up. So for her to have her mother and father, her idols, come back together and her career start to pick up, it must have been a very magical time. Shortly afterwards, Destiny's Child signed a contract with Columbia Records. It was the shape of things to come. From that point on, everything changed for Beyonce and for Destiny's Child too. Now with a major record label, Destiny's Child recorded their debut song, Killing Time. So Beyonce and Destiny's Child's big break did really come in 1997. They'd recorded a song called Killing Time, and it made it onto the Men in Black soundtrack, which obviously went on to become one of the biggest movies of the year. So it was the first time that really the world heard of Destiny's Child, and they heard Beyonce's voice for the first time as well. Their real breakthrough came the following year when the band released their self-titled debut album and scored their first big hit with the single No, No, No. That was, was a huge step to get them started. Even though the album was not a smash out of the gate, it, it peaked at number 67 in Billboard, but it had uh, the, the single, No, No, No. It took off, you know, it got play, um, especially the remix that they did with Like Love John. Hitting the top of the US Billboard charts, the single, produced by Wyclef Jean, quickly went platinum. Destiny's Child picked up three Soul Train Lady of Soul Awards in 1998 and headed back to the studio to create their second album. In 1999, the group released their second album, The Writings on the Wall. This time, it was multi-platinum success for the group, as the album included some of their most popular songs. The Writings on the Wall was, was sort of their, was their, was their breakthrough album. It, it sold millions and millions of copies. The last album, we were just starting out, and we were trying to find what we were going to go for, what our style was, and who we were going to work with. But this album, we were sure of who we were going to work with. We had a list. That album went to number three. It stayed on the charts for close to two years. We only wrote three songs on the last album, and this album, we wrote 11. So that's a big change, and we were involved more with this album. Their sassy lead single, Bills, 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 secured their first number one, while their album debuted at number six. Bills, Bills, Bills was, was an important record for them because it, it got this message out there about uh, their relationships and not being taken advantage of, not being victims. We're not talking to all guys, we're only talking to the one guy that is being trifling and is running up her phone bill and all of that. So if the guy wasn't doing that, we would never ask a guy to pay our bills. We believe in 50-50 relationships. Right. But we also know that guys can relate to yes. this situation too yes. because we know there are some girls out there that take guys' cars and yeah. drive them and feel like they can spend Go their credit diggers. cards and all that. You know, Bills, Bills, Bills was so popular, it spawned, you know, like rival rap tracks and kind of like, it, it just was everything, you know. And it was interesting because it said a lot about kind of w the tone that Beyonce's career would take. From at a pretty early age, she kind of took a, a very active role in producing. She didn't make beats, but she would kind of come up with the ideas and kind of write the melodies, which was which was a distinct contrast with most of her peers at the time who were, you know, these kind of prefab, you know, pop stars, you know, a group like NSYNC wasn't writing their own songs really. The album is more conceptual this time. Beyonce produced a majority of the vocals on the album. And if you notice when you listen to the album that the vocals are more in your face this time and mm -hmm. it's tight and it's all because Beyonce hooked it up. In early 2000, they released Say My Name, which soon proved to be one of the biggest hits of their career. It topped both the R&B and pop charts for three weeks and was a multi-award winner, securing MTV's best R&B video and then going on to win two prestigious Grammy Awards in 2001. What an album. We will never forget songs if we're part of that era like I was. Bills, 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 Say My Name. These became modern anthems. And it was the first time, actually, that everyone got started getting really excited about Destiny's Child because they weren't one-hit wonders, they weren't two-hit wonders. In fact, it was hit after hit after hit. But while the album went on to sell more than 8 million copies, the writing was certainly on the wall for the group. Just as Destiny's Child reached the height of their success, rivalries and bitter disputes behind the scenes threatened to bring them tumbling down. So it was at this point that massive tensions started developing in the band. The other members of the group, 
you know, complained that Matthew Knowles favored uh, Beyonce and Kelly Rowland. Uh, Kelly Rowland had been living with the family for a time and she, they were sort of parental figures for her. Essentially, Beyonce and Kelly Rowland were the two chosen members by Matthew. They were the two that had a future in the band and he wanted the other two out. Latoya Luckett and Latavia Roberson have provided some of the vocals for Say My Name. But when the video was released in early 2000, they were shocked to discover they'd been replaced by two new members, Michelle Williams and Farrah Franklin. What happened is that for the Say My Name video, he actually brought in two other girls, Michelle Williams, who we all know now, and Farrah Franklin, to be in the video, even though at this point they weren't official members of the band and they hadn't even recorded that song. So obviously at this point, all hell breaks loose. They filed the lawsuit against the group for breach of contract and eventually left, but not before a nasty media battle commenced. Luckett and Roberson then withdrew their case against their former bandmates, but maintained their suit against Beyonce's father. However, the controversy did nothing to slow the group's success, as their next memorable single, Jumpin' Jumpin', became another chart-topping hit. But the drama continued. Just as Destiny's Child began a string of dates opening for Christina Aguilera in July 2000, Farrah Franklin left after just five months with the group, and so the quartet became a trio. So four became three at this point, and for the first time, the world and the showbiz world really realized that Matthew could actually be very, very ruthless, because all of a sudden, three Destiny's Child girls were gone. And it also became clear at this point that this was Beyonce's band. She was the star, and everyone else was potentially disposable. During this time, 19-year-old Beyonce became depressed. The pressure of the split and the negative media attention was very difficult, and she was struggling to cope with the effects of her fame. Her personal life was affected too, when at around the same time, her long-term boyfriend ended their seven-year relationship. She breaks up with a boyfriend, and this was really when depression hit for her. This manifested itself in her staying in her room, um, sometimes not eating when she should have. And actually, that is the moment in Beyonce's life which actually led to the real dark period for her. She has spoken quite openly about the fact that it did lead to some sort of teenage depression. Turning once again to the family that had supported her this far throughout her life, she lifted herself out of the fog and bounced back. From the dark days, Beyonce learnt, at a very young age, how to be a strong, independent woman. Destiny's Child then recorded Independent Women, the hit theme to the 2000 film Charlie's Angels. A huge success, it gave the group their third number one in the US and their first in the UK. Yeah, well, Charlie's Angels was obviously a, a monster hit. I think at that moment they went from being a superstar band to a megastar band because Independent Woman was an anthem, and it was an anthem for that era. It's an interesting thing if you want to like frame it in terms of her career because she was on the verge of going solo shortly thereafter. So it almost it, it almost like operated as a manifesto for her, but you know simultaneously it also could operate as a manifesto for any woman that kind of you know wanted independence. So that kind of took her career into the stratosphere. Independent women also reached number one in Canada, Ireland, and New Zealand, and even entered the Guinness Book of Records for the longest running song by a female group, staying a staggering 11 consecutive weeks at the top of the Billboard charts. I think we've had an almost perfect year in 2000. I mean, right now we have number one single, Independent Women, for six weeks. We broke so many records. We had uh, Say My Name, it went number one. Bills, Bills, Bills went number one. Everything we put out went number one. Three was clearly a magic number for Destiny's Child. And the girls appeared to gel well together. But it was becoming clear that Beyonce was emerging as the group's unequivocal leader. Thank you as well as the trio's public face. Beyonce co-wrote all but one song on their highly anticipated third album. Are you sure that you wrote Survivor? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. I wrote Survivor along with about 10 other songs on the album. And it's really great that I got a chance to write on this album. I also wrote Independent Woman and Jumpin' Jumpin', so it's great. The album title, Survivor, proved to be a fitting name for a group that had endured so much internal struggle. Released in 2001, 
It went straight in at number one in the US and went on to sell over 10 million copies worldwide. It was a wonderful song. We were all in the studio in tears and crying and just, it's one of those kind of songs. And it's a wonderful song that Beyonce did. It's wonderful. The smash hit title track, Survivor, earned the group their third Grammy, this time for best R&B performance by a group with vocals. The second best known single on the album was Bootylicious. Sampling riffs from Stevie Nicks, Bootylicious was a sexy celebration of curvaceous females which became an instant hit. Helping to shape a cultural shift in attitudes to beauty, the word bootylicious soon entered the mainstream and was later included in the Oxford English Dictionary. You have a song like, like, bootylicious. It's like, I don't think anyone else would ever come up with that. Like, it's just basically about how awesome and how hot Beyonce is and how great her body is. Which, like, you can't really argue with it because Beyonce has a pretty great body. I was lucky enough to meet Beyonce briefly and when I saw her, I kind of developed a girl crush. I looked at her and my mouth was open. One of those people that doesn't look quite real. You know, she's glowing. The skin is perfect. The small of the back goes in, a bit like J.Lo. This beautiful, curvaceous bum. And I just thought, you know, I want to be you in my next life. When she was recording Survivor, the album, which was obviously a major project for her, given how much her voice was used on that album, she at the same time was offered and accepted the role in Carmen, which was a hip hop opera, which MTV was producing. And that was really when her acting career first started. After a hugely successful year, Destiny's Child released a holiday album, Eight Days of Christmas. Then came the shock announcement that they were going to take some time off to work on their solo projects. Well, apparently it was Matthew Knowles' claimed it was his kind of decision from the get-go that every girl would kind of have their own solo project and they would kind of focus on it. Um, you know, some would do gospel, some would kind of do more R&B kind of leaning things, some would do, you know, focus more on ballads. Looking at it with, you know, the hindsight of almost a decade later, it seems pretty obvious that it was a way for Beyonce to launch her solo career. Michelle Williams was the first to record a solo album, releasing Heart to Yours in April 2002. She was closely followed by Kelly Rowland, whose duet with Nelly on Dilemma in July proved to be a massive hit around the world, winning her a Grammy for Best Rap Sung Collaboration the following year. It's just incredible how huge that song was, and it wasn't even supposed to be a single. Me and Nelly just looked at each other when everything happened like, wow. I actually sat next to Kelly at a dinner table once at an awards do, a radio awards do, and she came across as a very strong, confident, gorgeous lady, and I can see why they got on so well as a pairing. Not only are they striking, um, but I think that Kelly would offer an awful lot of strength. She doesn't have quite the Beyonce effect, but you know, every guy on the table was looking at her. What I admire about Beyonce is that there was never that feeling, you didn't get that feeling that she was insecure about Kelly doing her solo thing. That's a very big testament to Beyonce. Because everybody in the industry was like going, well, you know, Beyonce's not gonna be happy about Kelly releasing a record by herself. Well, there's gonna be a lot of fights going on with that. And it was none of the kind. It was total support. Beyonce had already started solo work in 1999 but it wasn't until 2002 that she recorded her first solo single called Work It Out. Produced by the talented Neptunes, the track featured on the soundtrack for the comedy film Austin Powers and Goldmember, in which Beyonce made her big screen debut playing Foxy Cleopatra opposite Mike Myers. I think as Foxy Cleopatra in, in Goldmember, she was Foxy. They always choose a girl for that role, for Mike Myers' sidekick, as someone who's absolutely stunning, but also who doesn't take themselves too seriously and is very, very funny. Moving into the movies was kind of a uh, I think a natural move for her. I think uh, a lot of people in, in pop music these days say they, they are not simply looking to make hit records. And in Austin Powers and Goldmember, she showed that she could take on a character and, and be convincing about it. And all of a sudden, we all knew her name. So it went from being about Destiny's Child and it became about Beyonce Knowles. I think anybody who um, saw Destiny's Child early on really felt that uh, Beyonce was, was the star. Continuing her acting career the following year, 
She starred opposite Cuba Gooding Jr. in the romantic comedy The Fighting Temptations. Beyonce is beautiful, and not only that, she's a songstress, but she can act. Cuba has so much energy. He's so full of life. It's nice to be around that every day on the set. He's crazy, unpredictable. You don't know what he's going to do. But when it's time for him to work, he's the most professional, talented artist. Beyonce took the opportunity to do various collaborations with different artists. She performed a duet with Luther Vandross on the track The Closer I Get to You. This won them a Grammy Award the following year. But it was her collaboration with rapper Jay-Z that really paved the way for her to storm the charts with her solo debut. Right, Thank you. Thank you very much. Beyonce released her debut solo album, Dangerously in Love, in June 2003. It went straight to number one on the U.S. charts and topped seven other charts worldwide. Going platinum four times, it remains Beyonce's best-selling album to date, with fans buying more than 11 million copies worldwide. She'd been building this momentum, coming to the fore in Destiny's Child, and now here she is, Beyonce in all her glory. I think there is a common thread to Beyonce's songwriting, and it's clear that she's in control of what she's doing, because that common thread, aside from a voice and melodically, there are, there, are, there are things, but the common thread is that the songs are about being a strong woman. It's a, hers is a peculiarly modern form of feminism that you can be uh, singing, uh, I'm an independent woman, I pay for everything of myself, and then being upset that a man hasn't asked you to marry him. That, that, those are on the easy bed fellows. But that is, you know, this, this strange schizophrenic form of uh, feminism we have in the modern age. And um, Beyonce, I think, more than anybody's at the forefront of that. The buzz in showbiz world when Beyonce released her 2003 debut album was a swing from slight cynicism, yeah, yeah, another girl band member, to, oh my God, this is the next whatever, Madonna, perhaps. So Dangerous In Love is one of the biggest albums for a solo newcomer of all times and it spawned so many major hit singles. And Beyonce is particularly proud of this album because she actually had a huge falling out with her record company at the time behind the scenes. No one knew anything about it then but she's since spoken about it on stage during a performance. And basically she played her record company all of the songs from the album and they said that they didn't think there was a hit, a number one hit single in that album. And she actually went on to have over five number ones from that album, including one of the biggest songs of the year, Crazy in Love. I first heard it on the radio. I remember hearing it on the radio and going, you just, it's just like, I can't, this is just. When I heard Crazy in Love, I thought, what a catchy song. When I saw the video, I was obviously just blown away by the magnificence of this creature, Beyonce. And you had this feeling that she would be around for a long time. You could have thought, actually, it's such a good song, it could be a one-hit wonder. And I do think it will be played in decades' time. And people are fond of it. It gets you going, you hear the beat. It's so good, you can't, your, your face is contorted and the beat is so good, you, you can't keep still. It's like, oh, man, trying to do the dishes and it's, it was all going off, you know. And then when I saw the video, that was it. The video is the most amazing thing that I've ever seen. It was the way that she walked on the road there. It was a dirty road with a broken down car, but the way she did that walk, I mean, and I always thought that Naomi Campbell was the queen of the catwalk, because she's amazing when she does that catwalk. But Beyonce tore it up. I mean, she walked along that little dusty road with the little jeans on and the cap, and you were like, and then she went, uh, uh, and you were like, ah, yeah. Most importantly though, you didn't get the feeling somebody had written it for her, you got the feeling she had control, she owned it. And that's the thing about Beyonce, she owns everything she does. It was a fantastic landmark for her. I think coming out of this sort of girl thing and what an amazing debut as a solo artist. I mean, you can't get higher than that. She just completely destroyed it. I think when I saw that video, you just realized, wow, Beyonce is a solo superstar here. Crazy in Love, featuring Jay-Z, peaked at the top for eight consecutive weeks. The video won three awards at the MTV Video Awards in the category of Best Female Video, Best R&B Video, and Best Choreography. The video also drew attention to the sizzling chemistry between Beyonce and Jay-Z. Um, it's been rumors about all types of crazy things since I was 15. That's just a part of being a celebrity. So I deal with it. I'm not, it doesn't make me upset or 
It doesn't make me feel anything. It's just a part of my life. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's just a rumor. Everyone was talking about it because no one was quite sure if they were sort of together at that time, and and it was just, you know, it was. Are they? Are they? You know, it's like, is it real? Are they really together? Is it business or what? It was kind of the early stages, but the chemistry that you saw between. Uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z in that video was electrifying and they didn't even actually do anything in terms of kissing or anything like that but it was just the intensity it was powerful you know and she was like close to him and you know she has that thing when she breathes and she kind of goes <sighs> and it's like oh my god it was all going off it was great I think it was a way to kind of preserve the mystique and also kind of fuel the flames of speculation and you know it's album promotion time you know everyone needs an angle she was dangerously in love with Question mark. Through Crazy in Love, Beyonce became the first female artist, and the fifth artist ever, to top both the singles and album charts simultaneously in the US and the UK. The next single from the album, Baby Boy, was a collaboration with Sean Paul, which spent nine weeks at number one, a week longer than Crazy in Love. That same year, she started her Dangerously in Love tour. There were just so many hits on that album. Virtually every song could have been released and been a number one hit single. So you realize that she's not just good at doing the odd song. She really is all about having hit after hit after hit. The 46th Grammys that year proved exceptional for her. Despite all of the negative criticism from the record company about the album in the first place before it was released, not only did she have so many number ones, she won five Grammy Awards as well. So she was on the top of the music world. After a three-year hiatus, Beyoncé rejoined Kelly Rowland and Michelle Williams for what would be Destiny's Child's fourth and final studio album, Destiny Fulfilled. The girls spent three weeks working on the album together. We've waited for this. We told the fans years ago that we would do solo projects and that we would come back out together in 2004, and here we are. Unlike Survivor, where Beyoncé had taken the most active role in writing and producing the tracks, Destiny Fulfilled saw each member contributing to the production, drawing on their own personal experiences from the last three years to influence their work. The album hit the charts at number two, and later that same year, Destiny's Child embarked on what became their last world tour together. The album's lead single, the frantically catchy Lose My Breath, was a huge hit for what looked to fans like a meteoric comeback. It's so sweet to sign both my CD and my vinyl, so big up. I like all of them. Obviously, Beyonce, she's doing it. But at a concert in Barcelona in the summer, Kelly Rowland announced in front of 16,000 shocked fans that it would be their last European tour and that they would soon part company. The official announcement that Destiny's Child had disbanded actually came from Kelly Rowland on their European tour. Now, I think this was an extremely astute move. If Beyonce had have been the one who announced to the press, they would have had a field day because she was the strong one leaving Destiny's Child behind because she'd had great solo success. This gave Kelly Rowland a little bit of power um, so that she wasn't looking like the girl who was in the dark. I think when Destiny's Fulfilled came out, Beyonce felt that she should give the band one more go. She didn't want her fans to think that she'd turned her back on Destiny's Child. Although for everyone in the music industry, it was pretty obvious at this point that this was their swan song and that they would all go their separate ways. I don't think it was seen at the time that they recorded it as, as necessarily the swan song. Um, Matthew Knowles was, was uh, talking at the time about maybe adding another member and making it a quartet again. Um, which didn't happen, but it was a good way to close that chapter of Destiny's Child. It was an amicable split, however, with each of the members insisting they wanted to remain wed to pursuing their individual careers and that they'd all remain friends. And so, after 10 years, Destiny's Child officially retired. Having sold over 100 million records around the world, they remain to this day the top-selling female vocal group of all time. We want to thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts. We love you so, so much. When Beyonce first went solo, she was still with Destiny's Child. So Destiny's Child disbanded in 2005. She went off on her own for her first album in 2003. We knew she would have a very long career because 
She was born to be a solo artist. Yes, she was great with Destiny's Child, but actually, if you look back, and it's all very well with the benefit of hindsight, look back at the Destiny's Child videos, she's the strongest, she's the sexiest, she's the one that was always gonna do it. It was already pretty clear that, you know, she was, I mean, she's got a name like Beyonce, it's like a mononym. She, you know, like those are the people that always get famous, you know, it's like Bono. It's like at some point, like, he had to just be like, everyone, just call me Bono. And like, she already had that from the get-go. Beyonce picked up the baton where she'd left off with her solo career, with the release of her third US number one single and global hit, Check On It, in 2005. She then put her second solo album on hold after landing a role in the film Dreamgirls, starring alongside Jamie Foxx, Jennifer Hudson, and Eddie Murphy. I definitely was out of my comfort zone. I was terrified, I was scared, nervous, a little insecure, and um, I just said, you know, I have this opportunity and I can feel it in my gut that I'm here for a reason and I'm gonna work as hard as I can. And like I said, the hard work paid off. She was playing obviously a Diana Ross like figure. And you know, it was, it was the obviously the coincidence wasn't lost. They cast her because she kind of occupied a similar space in, in, in culture as this kind of, you know, larger than life diva. The film was an adaptation of the 1981 Broadway musical about the rise of an all-female singing group from the Motown 60s, loosely based on the Supremes. Absolutely, Diana Ross was a huge inspiration. I had her posters, all of the movies she's done, all of her music. It's the only thing I listened to the whole time we were filming this movie. Destiny's Child had been kind of a Diana and the Supremes kind of a situation. Diana Ross launched the Jackson 5. And Matthew Knowles from the get-go had always envisioned his stable of artists as, as sort of Motown. And I think that was sort of the, you know, the kind of capstone on, on his plan and his goals. Beyonce had always been a huge fan of the Supremes, so this really was a dream role for her. It was amazing because when I read the script, I always knew about this you know, musical and I was always in love with it. But Dina um, really was not the most vocally talented member of, of the Dreams. So I could not depend on my voice. So it was really mainly the acting, which was important to me because I, you know, I've sang before and I wanted to show myself that I can act. But it also had its challenges. She famously lost 22 pounds in two weeks by undergoing a drastic diet in which she could only drink maple syrup mixed with cayenne pepper, lemon juice, and water. As well as starring in the film, she also recorded several songs for the soundtrack, including the original song, Listen. Portraying the Diana Ross-based character, Dina Jones, Beyonce received critical acclaim for her acting and went on to receive two Golden Globe nominations for Best Actress in a Motion Picture Musical or Comedy and Best Original Song for Listen. What this gave Beyonce for the first time was real credibility, not just in the music industry, but also in Hollywood. And that's really important because the real megastars of our times, the Bette Midlers, the Madonnas, the Barbra Streisands, they all have credibility in the music industry, but also in Hollywood as well. There were other pop stars that tried to do movies. I mean, obviously Britney Spears had Crossroads. I don't think anyone was really offering Christina Aguilera that many film roles. Jessica Simpson obviously was gonna carry a, a film. But Beyonce was able to kind of transcend that. I feel great, but more than the, the big success, I just feel good that um, I know now that if I work hard enough that I can, I am an actress. Her film career continued when she took the role Xenia, an international pop star opposite Steve Martin's Inspector Clouseau. The film was a number one hit at the box office in its opening weekend in February 2006. The film made $22 million in its first week of release. So really, her star was well and truly established and her star power and money-making power was also established at this point. It's often easy to forget how young Beyonce is. With all her achievements, she's already lived a lifetime. On September 4th, 2006, on what was only her 25th birthday, she released her second solo album, aptly named B-Day. Most people, like, by the age, you know, at this point, Beyonce's in her late 20s. Most people, by the time they're in their late 20s, they're, like, not that really stoked about their birthday. You're like, yeah, it's just another year of school, you know? But Beyonce, because she's Beyonce and not like a normal human being because she's so bootylicious, she decides to um, write an entire album around her birthday. It was, it was a huge success and everyone now knows that Beyonce's birthday is in September. 
Much of the themes and musical style of the album were inspired by Beyonce's role in Dreamgirls, and she co-wrote and co-produced nearly all of the songs. The album B-Day that came after the Dreamgirls film was uh, something of a surprise to fans and even to the record company. I think she recorded it in something like three weeks. I had so many songs and so many concepts bottled up inside, being away from performing and singing for six months that while I was on, um, on my vacation, I told everyone, please let me be. Don't ask me to do anything. Don't, don't call me. Let me go away and relax and get my mind back and kind of come back to my body because I've been in Dina's body, the character, for so long. And while I was there, I couldn't relax. So I said, well, I'm, in, I'm, I'm coming back to New York. I'm going to be down the street from Sony Studios. I might as well just sneak over there. They weren't expecting an album from her. For, for another year. Uh, but she said at the time, just, you know, she can't stand still. B-Day rapidly became a number one hit in the U.S., selling 541,000 copies in its first week alone. It also peaked in the top 10 charts of another 18 countries around the world. By now, Beyonce had been in a relationship with rapper Jay-Z for several years, so it was no surprise to see her collaborating with him again. Deja Vu was the album's lead single and topped the hot R&B hip-hop songs in the United States. Beyonce's collaboration with Shakira for the third single, Beautiful Liar, earned her the Most Shattering Collaboration Award at the 2007 MTV Video Music Awards. The album produced three other singles which were notable successes, Ring the Alarm, Green Light, and Upgrade You. It also won the Best Contemporary R&B Album at the 49th Grammy Awards and has gone on to sell nearly 6 million albums worldwide. Beyoncé and Jay-Z had been dating since 2002, but had always remained discreet about their relationship. Their collaborations together led to rumors circulating about them, but they remained tight-lipped, determined to keep their love out of the public eye. You have no wedding plans? <laughs> no, I'm not where rushing. Are they, where are they getting this? I, they've been saying it about every celebrity for ever. You know, it's not personal. They, they do it to everyone. As a couple, their influence stretched far and wide. In 2006, they were listed as the most powerful couple by Time magazine, while the following year, Forbes ranked them as Hollywood's top-earning couple with a combined income of $162 million. The question on everyone's lips was, will they marry? Who knows? I, that happens whenever it happens. It happens. It could happen in a year. It could happen in five years. They were married in a small, intimate ceremony in Manhattan, New York, on April 4, 2008. But Beyonce didn't publicly display her 18-carat flawless diamond wedding ring worth an estimated $5 million until she was on the red carpet at the Fashion Rocks concert the following month. Later that year, at the 2008 World Music Awards, she was given the award for Outstanding Contribution to the Arts and Dangerously in Love was listed as one of the top 200 definitive albums in music history by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Her eagerly awaited third solo album hit the shops in November 2008, debuting yet again at number one on the US Billboard 200. I Am, Sasha Fierce, was a dual disc album. The first disc, I Am, incorporates slow and mid-temp R&B ballads, while the second disc, Sasha Fierce, contains more up-tempo pop and dance tunes, which cross from Euro to Electropop. Sasha Fierce is Beyonce's alter ego, the sexy, seductive, and provocative persona she embodies on stage. It's really crazy because something happens to me when I get on the stage. I'm really calm and shy and just, you know, Kind of, I just observe, and I'm completely opposite of how I am on the stage. Um, when I get on the stage, I have no idea what's in my head. It's just performing, and I don't even remember what goes through my head because I turn into this crazy wild woman. <laughs> the I Am disc is intended to reflect Beyonce's shy, softer, real self. That portion was a lot more real and raw and more sensitive, so I think, you know, it just takes you through this emotional journey. I love not surprisingly, her fans reacted very positively to both sides of her persona. Her first single from the album, the gentle ballad If I Were a Boy, 
topped eight charts worldwide, while the upbeat girl power anthem Single Ladies put a ring on it, going straight to the top. It gave Beyonce her fifth number one single. The music video for Single Ladies achieved global fame in its own right, with its choreography credited for creating a dance craze that has been both acclaimed and parodied. At the 2009 MTV Video Awards, it received nine nominations and won Video of the Year. But when Beyonce lost out in the Best Female category to country star Taylor Swift, it sparked Kanye West to jump up on stage and defend her in a controversy that was talked about for months afterwards. His previous tantrums, I've been, oh, he's kind of misunderstood. He's a little egotistical, but last night, just jumping in front of Taylor Swift and, you know, taking, stealing her moment, that was ridiculous. I thought it was funny. I actually thought it was funny. I still think it's funny. Other hits from the album include Halo, Sweet Dreams, Broken Hearted Girl, and Videophone, on which she collaborated with pop sensation Lady Gaga. This was one of the collaborations on the album which led to it becoming the first album of the 21st century to have a staggering seven entries on that chart. I was told that we are tied for the most nominations ever. So uh, I feel very honored and um, I'm delighted to be in Beyonce's company. It's very humbling, just when you think you are hot stuff, then you know, you never know what people are gonna say. The album earned Knowles eight nominations for the 52nd Grammy Awards. An additional two nominations were awarded for her vocal contribution to the soundtrack of the musical biopic Cadillac Records, about the life of the legendary soul singer Etta James, whom Beyonce also played the part of in the film. The hardest thing, probably the emotional scenes. Every day I would come home with swollen eyes and um, having to, to think about the most painful things that have happened to me in my life, um, just so I can give an honest performance. It was difficult because I'm, I'm not a person that dwells on negativity. and It was hard, but you know, it was necessary and I think I, I gave the best performance of my life. Overall, she received a total of 10 nominations. She then went on to set the record for the most number of Grammy Awards won on a single night by a female artist when she won six out of her 10 nominations. In 2009, Beyonce performed at the inauguration of President Obama and sang At Last, as Obama and his first lady had their first dance. It's a, a testament to Beyonce's success that she performed not only at Obama's inauguration, but during the first dance where Michelle and, and Barack Obama danced together. I mean, that must have taken some wheeling and dealing behind the scenes. And then the choice of song, the, the song made famous by Etta James at last. Uh, she, she didn't use it for self-promotion. She just went with something very classic and, and you know, created a great moment um, in, in pop history and that, that sort of history of pop music and ent um, uh, entertainment and politics fusing like that. It was a really special moment. It was very, very cleverly done. She also starred in a thriller called Obsessed with Ali Larder and Idris Elba. The whole crew was phenomenal. Beyonce was especially great because she, you know, she came with open arms to just embrace this character. You know, in, in this case, she's not playing a singer or anything like that that she's more comfortable with. It's a very, very uh, a big challenge for her, so she did a good job. She did a great job. She then set off on her third tour, this time for I Am Sasha Fierce which involved an exhaustive 97 concerts around the world. I finished the, the last tour a year ago, and now here I am, I'm gonna be on the tour for another year. Um, thank God I love what I do, and, and I have time in between. But, you know, I'm so excited, and this is what I, I was born to do, so it's my life, you know? And I couldn't imagine not being on tour doing records, so I have the time of my life on the stage. Not surprisingly, in early 2010, Beyonce announced she wanted to take a break from music. Beyonce has always had another passion alongside her love of music, fashion. I know she started a line of clothing with her mother, Tina Knowles, and uh, from an early age, obviously. You know, obviously music and, and fashion, are they go hand in hand. Um, and her mother, you know, was, was sewed their costumes from an early age, so I think Beyonce obviously developed a very early appreciation for for clothing. Keep in mind, she's also married to someone like Jay-Z, who's a fashion mogul in, in his own right, with Rockaware. In 2005, she created the House of Darion with her designer mother, Tina Knowles. The name Darion pays tribute to Knowles' grandmother, Agnes Darion, 
who worked as a seamstress. I love House of Darion because, um, for one, it's a collaboration with my mother, and it celebrates three generations. It's my grandmother, my mother, and myself. And my mother's my stylist. She pulls all the clothes with Ty Hunter, my other stylist. And it's great working with her. For one, she's my best friend, and I admire her. And if I could be like anyone, it'd be her because she's just a, such a strong, smart, beautiful woman. Brand Beyonce is such an important brand now and a powerful brand. So you have a whole load of companies like L'Oreal and Pepsi and Armani who are desperate to be associated with it. And it is one of the biggest brands in music now. What I'm so interested in is that unlike brand Britney or brand Madonna, it's never been damaged. She's, she's never been involved in some sort of major scandal. So actually, that's what makes brand Beyonce even more powerful. Beyonce has always been commercially savvy and over the years has associated herself with some of the biggest brands in the world. I had a real problem when Beyonce became sort of like this brand person. You know, she was behind all of these campaigns, Coca-Cola, Tommy Hilfiger and the rest. Her earnings are said to be close to $100 million per year since 2007, and she was also listed at number two on the list of the 100 most powerful and influential celebrities in the world. I think it was overkill, and I, and I always think that. I think that, you know, if, if you do too many of those things, people start to get sick of you. It's overexposure, and uh, you look like you're, you, you're sold to the highest bidder. There was a point there where Beyonce was touching, peaking, I think, with that. And I'm quite happy now that she's pulled back from doing as many brands. In 2010, as if there weren't enough strings to her bow, Beyonce launched her first perfume called Heat. In 2010, Beyonce launched her own perfume, Heat. The commercial for the ad, which features a sexy and sultry Beyonce, was deemed too sexually provocative for British audiences, so was banned on UK daytime TV. I've seen the, uh, the um, commercial for, for her fragrance, Heat, and it's a, it's a pretty steamy, pretty sultry uh, video. It couldn't have been more sexy if she was wearing no clothes. The girl's covered up. You know, what woman doesn't wish she could get banned for looking too sexy while being fully clothed? But it's just like she is the essence of sexiness. But there was nothing wrong there. She wasn't showing her boobs. Everything was covered. It was just like, how can one woman be so hot just by breathing and walking? And she does it. But aside from building her own brand, Beyonce's philanthropic interests have included fundraising benefit gigs as well as her setting up a charity with fellow Destiny's Child member and friend Kelly Rowland. Many people don't realise that Beyonce is also a philanthropist. She gives an awful lot of time and money to charities. In fact, the list is this long. It goes on and on. Some celebrities' lists are this long, but my God, don't we know about it? You know, they want photos taken when they're doing this and that. I'm doing a fun run, look at me, isn't this great? Beyonce doesn't broadcast it, but she is very giving. And again, it's very true to her. She does things quietly when she's not on stage, um, and she doesn't want thanks for her, congratulated. I perform so much and do so many great things, but these are the things that really matter. On March 28th, 2011, Beyonce's fans were shocked to learn that she would no longer be managed by her father, Matthew Knowles. After 16 professional years together, they decided to part ways. Recently married to the hugely talented and successful rapper Jay-Z, Beyonce's fans fear she might soon settle down. I have a long way to go and I have a lot of time for that. I feel like that would be a great job. I want to tuck my kids in to, to bed and drop them off at school and you know, go do my show for two hours and go back home every day. I feel like that's really stable, but I have time for that. Her fans needn't worry just yet. Her highly anticipated fourth solo album, released in June 2011, will no doubt be another chart topper. Beyonce's creative legacy continues to grow. Scaling ever higher musical heights, she's produced a range of hybrid tracks fusing R&B with pop, grimy dance hall with futuristic electronica, and African beats with military marching bands. New York Times has called her the woman with everything. With 16 Grammys, two Golden Globe nominations, 
several lucrative advertising contracts, and a successful fashion house under her belt, it's easy to see why. She is currently the only artist in history to have all her studio albums win the Grammy Award for Best Contemporary R&B Album and debut at the number one spot in the Billboard 200 throughout her solo career. With her new album, she looks set to break her own record. I describe her um, as incredibly grounded and very, very religious. I feel like God has given me the gifts, every gift that I have, every blessing that I have. And I feel like he puts certain people in my life for a reason, certain angels, certain people protecting me, things that happen to, to everyone. There's no way you cannot believe that someone isn't looking out for you. And he takes people out of my life that shouldn't be there. And I just feel protected all the time. You're talking about someone who's been groomed to do this. So you do get the impression with her as well that as much as she's very polite and everything else, that you don't really get to know her. That's what's interesting, is that she's learned how to be the star that she needs to be at that time, but you still aren't getting who she really is. Because she has to do that to protect her privacy. But she does it in such a nice way that if you're an outsider, you would never know that. Do you know what I mean? She's good at that. As a solo artist, Beyonce has sold over 11.2 million albums and nearly 25 million singles in the United States alone. Her total album and single sales, when combined with Destiny's Child, have surpassed 100 million. She is undoubtedly one of the best-selling artists of all time. I just love talent and entertainment, and I want to be a real entertainer. Whatever she chooses to do next, we can be sure that Beyonce Knowles will continue to shine.